Hey, it's Freddy Cruz, and I've got a big old vault of podcast content for you. In fact, I'm digging into the archives from a previous podcast conversation I had with New York Times bestselling author of the Pike Logan series, Brad Taylor. He had stopped by Houston to talk about his new novel, The Devil's Ransom. This happened about a year ago, and we covered a lot of ground in a conversation we recorded before an audience at Murder by the Book. Everything from killing off characters to writing his first book as one long chapter. So if you don't have a copy, you don't know what to get for somebody on your Christmas wish list, then, well, go ahead and get The Devil's Ransom wherever you buy your books. Hi, I'm Ed Sheeran. This is Bruno Mars. Hey, it's Katy Perry. This is your man Flo Rida with Freddie Cruz. This is AJ Mitchell with Freddie Cruz. Freddie Cruz. Freddie Cruz. Cruz. Let's go pick Mr. 305 and you already know what it is. My name is Freddie and it's time to cruise through HTX. Shout out to Murder by the Book, which is... Uh, hands down, the greatest bookstore in the city of Houston, possibly all over the world. And I'm not just Definitely. saying, not Definitely. just not just saying that because we're here right now and because they let me crash the party. Well, but I can say because I go to plenty of bookstores. So <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about that. Um, but uh, wow, the Devil's Ransom is crazy. <laughs> I mean, bonkers because we're talking ransomware. We're talking. Uh, people that are supposed to be good guys that are bad guys. You got me feeling bad. I was just talking to what, what, one of your readers here. Uh, at one point in the book, I felt as though I felt a little bad that I was starting to kind of empathize with the the villain, yeah, Dylan. So let, let's start there because he's like a textbook example of a, a bureaucrat who who gets bullied by everybody. And I got to know how hard or how easy that was to to form to form him. Yeah, well, uh, whenever I'm writing, whenever anybody should be writing, so you, I write my protagonist, and everybody writes a protagonist as in, I'm going to make this guy, he's full flesh and all this kind of stuff. The antagonist has got to be the same way. And uh, there is, uh, a, it's very simple to just say, uh, um, well, the bad guy is Dr. Evil. He's twirling a Dudley Do last mustache, and, and he wants $1 million. But everybody I've met, I mean, I've, I've sat across the table from real terrorists, and after you've captured them, they're sitting there laughing, cracking jokes, drinking Coca-Cola, and they're kind of nice guys. And you're like, why does that guy want to blow everybody up? Uh, you know, why is he so evil? Well, he, in his mind, is not evil. Yep. He is doing the right thing. I'm the bad guy. He's the good guy. And every antagonist has a motivation that should be something beyond. I mean, there are evil people. John Wayne Gacy would be one. You know, that guy's just flat out evil. Uh, but everybody on the national security stage has got some kind of motivation. So in this motivation, Bronco is motivated just by money. He doesn't really think he's a bad guy. He's just trying to make some money. If he knew how bad it was going to get, which he finds out in the book, he would have never done it. Right. Uh, Dylan is motivated by, he thinks he's helping America. They, you know, they may not realize this, but there's a greater good here. And at the end of this thing, we're going to have a better nation because of what I'm doing. Yeah. And that is the crux of the matter because I'm like, dude, all right, he he's he's got a point. I mean, we're polarized, and he wants yeah. to he wants to unite by create by wreaking havoc on not just the country but on the world, and just oh well, you know what? We're gonna make it Iran. Uh, it's like he's got the globe yeah. spinning, and it's like ah, those guys. Yeah, I want to unite everybody in the United States against a common foe. Yeah, who is that common foe? I'll find a common foe, and then we won't have to all this fighting going on. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't care that he's going to get a bunch of people murdered. I mean, that to him is there's a greater good here. There's something better than just uh, you know, sorry for those guys dying, but hey, I got a nation to save. Yeah, exactly. We're going to unify the people yeah. around you know the, around my hurt feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but perhaps the most, I guess the, the most controversial take, uh, about this book right here is, is your view of, of Croatian gelato. And this is, <laughs> and this is something I'm like, okay, wait a minute. He's, he's going, he's going someplace here. And then I'm listening to uh, previous podcast interviews where you're talking about the devil's ransom. And I'm like, wow, I, this is, this is interesting. So for people who are in the audience, they're going to be reading and they're going to be like, no, there's no way Croatian Croatian yeah, gelato? It's the, <laughs> it's the best ever. And I do get asked about this in every interview. And I'm like, how does everybody wonder about the Croatian gelato? I just loved it. <laughs> so they, we went to, I've had gelato in Italy and I've had, Charleston has gelato shops, which are horrible. And uh, I, we had some, we pulled over to a small town. There's a, it's a uh, kind of a Baskin Robbins for Croatia, but it's made, they make gelato. And it, it's, uh, I can't remember the name, but Elaine would tell me it's Pepino's, Pepito's. So we went there, had some gelato. I was like, this is the best stuff ever. I must have ate a gallon of it. 
<laughs> and so we started out in Zagreb and drove all the way down through every small town, all the way down to Dubrovnik. And every time we hit a town, I was like, there's got to be one of those Baskin Robbins gelato places around here. <laughs> and if I saw it, we'd go get some gelato. So, uh, yeah, Pike eats some gelato in the book. Well, and that scene, I com- it, it felt so re- just real and raw, everybody that's in the audience, that when you read it, you actually picture my man Brad yeah. eating heaps and heaps of this stuff because it's just so real. And uh, these characters, this is just one component of how of how you just make these these people come to life on the page. And um, you know, I'm I'm speaking to uh, some of the audience members, um, and one of them. I didn't catch your name and I apologize, but he wants to know about your writing process. And I don't think, I don't think this is something we talked about last year or the year before when you were on my, on my show, but are you a pantser or a plotter? Uh, I'm a little bit of both. So I don't do, um, I don't do an outline where chapter one is this and here's what's going to happen chapter two all the way down until I figure out what chapter 30 is or 90 or whatever it's going to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know some writers are. Kyle Mills actually does a 110-page outline. Insane. And I'm like, 110 pages? <laughs> Hell, you could have half the book done. <laughs> uh, so I know where, I know the threat factor. I know where I'm going. And I would have said up until No Fortunate Son, uh, I, I 100% knew the ending. Mm-hmm. Now it's about 80% I'll know the ending. Uh, so I, I know the general scheme of maneuver. I, if it was going to be military talk, I'd say strategically, I know where I want to go. Operationally, I see where the, the uh, uh, pieces are fitting together. Tactically, I still have to figure it out. I don't know exactly how that's going to work. Yeah, in, in building off that, your plot lines are, are ripped from the headlines. And so I'd like to know where in the process you draw the line with falling down rabbit holes. Are you up to like, um, I know uh, David Baldacci has his infamous blue notebook where he's got the, the hundreds of pages and then there's maybe one or two sentences in there, but how does it work with you as far as research? Are you, do you cut yourself off after a certain amount of, of headlines or are you going to be watching? No, no, no it, it actually depends on the book. Well, I'm not to get in the future. I'm writing a book right now. Obviously I have to put a new book out. Yep. Um, and I chose Ukraine, which it's driving me nuts because it's changing every damn day. And I'm like, why did you pick this? Why did you pick this thread? Because you, yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And so I decide just to pick a point in time. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pick a point in time. Whatever happens next, I'm going to say up front, you're reading this date right now. So don't worry about what happens next. <laughs> when I did the research for this, it was um, usually it's some kind of story that picks my interest. Something comes across that I see, uh, like for the widow's strike, I'm going to pat myself on the back on this one. (laughs) So it was about avian flu pandemic. And I wrote that in 2014, I think. And everything I had in there was mask and social distance and everything. I was like, wow, I could be (laughs) Fauci. So I, uh, uh, and I was just guessing because we hadn't had a pandemic in forever. But that story was that avian flu is uh, a very deadly flu. I mean, coronavirus has got 1%. Avian flu is 40% will get killed. So on the one hand, it's a very bad uh, disease. On the other hand, it's not airborne. So it's really hard to get. Unless you're cutting up a chicken that's got avian flu, you probably won't get it. Yeah. Well, these guys went, which we now know is gain of function. They developed, a, they made it airborne so they could develop a vaccine for it. And then they were going to put it out into, they were going to publish it in the journal Nature or something. And uh, we have a biomedical uh, organization in America that said, no, you can't do that. You're basically producing a terrorist weapon. Anybody can get that information weaponize avian flu and cause a pandemic. We're not going to let you do that. And I saw that story and I was like, that's a book. I can write that. So for this one, I was reading a story. There's a a company in Israel called NRO. I don't know if anybody's heard of it. They make uh, a malware program called uh, Pegasus. And Pegasus is an infiltration malware for Android phones, iPhones, anything like that. You can get inside the phone and it turns it into a surveillance device. So they can hear all your calls. They can see who you're texting. They can see every web page you'd go to. They can geolocate you. They can turn on the camera. They can turn on the microphone. It just basically completely compromises your phone. And uh, they said, we're only going to sell this to nation states who are good guys. Uh, and so that's how they're going to do this. And they had all these blanket protocols of how they're going to sell it. And they ended up selling it to UAE. And by the way, the Mexican drug cartels are using it now. So oh, that didn't beautiful. fly too much. They sold it to UAE, and UAE is one of the good guys, one of the allies, said, okay, we're only going to use it uh, to counter terrorism. That's why we're using Pegasus software. Now, Pegasus is what's known as zero click, meaning you don't have to do anything. They can inject it into your phone without you knowing. Most malware, 99.9% of malware is because you did something wrong, and they, it's called social engineering, 
they did social engineering to get you to do something. You get a text in your phone that says, your FedEx package is coming in today. If this is not meant for you, click here. And you I don't have a FedEx package. Click. Well, you've now got malware. Or uh, your Google password's been changed. If this is not you, click here. Click. You've now got malware. That requires social engineering on the part of the operator to actually trick you into doing that. This was zero click. They didn't have to do anything. They just sicken in there. Well, at UAE, they had a thing called Project Raven. And Project Raven was actually run by a bunch of NSA guys, ex-NSA guys from the United States of America. And they were injecting that malware and dissonance journalists, and they started hitting American citizens. Uh, the FBI found out about that we have Americans working for the UAE that are targeting American citizens who are journalists in the Middle East. And those guys actually all went to jail. Uh, but as I started studying that threat vector, I hit on ransomware. And ransomware is just an enormous problem that you don't really see on the news. Uh, the only time you'll see ransomware on the news is when it's a, uh, a, a critical infrastructure gets hit, a life support activity. So when a hospital gets hit, it'll make the news. Colonial Pipeline got hit. All our gas prices went up. That makes the news. Meatpacking industry got knocked out on two different continents, uh, us and Australia. Price of beef went up. That makes the news. Uh, Costa Rica, the entire country of Costa Rica, was taken down for three days. That makes the news. Well, there are bazillions of companies getting hit by ransomware all the time, and they don't want anybody to know they got hit by ransomware because it makes them look unsafe. So if you're a bank and you get hit by ransomware, you're going to pay that and not let anybody know that you got hit because you're not going to tell your people, bring your money and invest it in me. <laughs> oh, yeah, we got cyber stuff going on if you want to do that. Mm. Uh, I was just doing an interview in, Houston, or in uh, Charleston, and I was talking to the guy about, you know, the ransomware stuff before we went on air. And he said, you know, we got hit by ransomware last year. Knocked us out for two weeks. We were doing all our stuff in a studio truck that we used for hurricanes. We couldn't do anything. Email got knocked out. The FBI was here. Blah, blah, blah. He's going on and on. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I'm going to mention that as soon as we got on air. Don't tell anybody that, though. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want anybody to know. And he's on a big, I'm not going to say that, that he's on a syndicated network. The entire network got hit. And uh, you'd know the network if I said the name, but uh, he had uh, he said, "Don't so we don't want anybody to know we got hit. It wiped out everybody on the East Coast. We don't want anybody to know. And it's just a huge problem. And I thought to myself, uh, after doing the, the Pegasus thing, ransomware is a social engineering thing. Somebody in the company made a mistake on, hey, look at the picture of my dog. It's the cutest thing ever. Click, and everything gets locked up. Uh, but I thought if they made ransomware that was zero click, we'd all be in a world of hurt. If they could just put it in there without having to get some idiot to press the button, it would lock out a lot of stuff. And that started the threat vector. That's a kind of a long answer for where the research came from. Way more effective than an EMP. Seems yeah, like it sorry. would be a lot easier. Yeah, well, if you talk about it, you're talking about an electrical grid, something like that? Yeah, EMP, electromagnetic pulse. Yeah, the, so the EMP is, uh, the only way you can do an EMP is an uh, airburst nuclear weapon. So people always ask me, you know, does Iran have an EMP? Do they have a nuclear weapon? No, no, then they don't have an EMP. <laughs> I mean, yeah. so the, uh, and our, our electrical grid actually is pretty, ransomware can hit our grid. Uh, there's a good news story and a bad news story about our electrical grid. The good news story is it's such a hodgepodge. Uh, we didn't set out to build an electrical grid. It just started building it on itself. Mm. There's an exchange in the uh, West, exchange in the East. Texas has its own exchange. They all cross over and connect to each other, but everybody's got their own systems in place. So you could take out a good portion of, uh, you know, say Houston, but you're not going to wipe out our entire electrical grid. Yeah. The bad news is all the computers are like Windows XP, and so it's pretty easy to hit. I want to shift the conversation, Brad, to violence, um, because there are some components of this book which <laughs> remind me in a good way of uh, something that maybe Jack Bauer would say, uh, and, and it's artful, it's beautiful, which is such a strange dichotomy, but how do you know when to when to dial it back and then when you can go a little more medieval with uh, somebody's toes. Oh, well, he didn't actually do anything. Oh, I know, but, but <laughs> he's talking and saying these things, but there also, there's also, yeah, there's well, also a gunshot and I don't want to ruin it for people who are, who haven't read the book yet, but there's also a, a gunshot victim. And, and that, that part was, I'm like, whoa, okay. I had to go back and read the, the paragraph. Okay. What happened to so the gunshot well victim? They you, tried to save his life. No, I'm talking about the woman. Oh, well, you can't give that away. Right, exactly. <laughs> I'm not, that's why I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to name names or anything or what part of the book. So, no, I, actually, you mentioned Jack Bauer. I, used to, I couldn't stand watching Jack Bauer because it was always, it was always, he was always right. 
as a protagonist yeah. in Hollywood, you're always right. And yeah. it's always a bureaucracy that's wrong or somebody else is wrong. And if they just let me put this drill bit through this guy's knee, I could solve <laughs> the nuclear problem in New York City. Yeah. And uh, uh, when I'm writing scenes that are violent, there's combat's not like that. I mean, you make decisions in combat over and over. You don't try to make bad decisions, but you're going to live with that decision. Yeah. And when you make a decision and it goes bad, you're going to live with that the rest of your life. I yeah. mean, you're going to, you know, I, I wish I'd have done, you'll wake up at night thinking I should have done A and I did B. Uh, and you're specifically talking about the female, which I won't, name I won't mention. That's the decision they made and it ended up bad. Right. And they have to live with that the rest of their life. It's something they're going to have to deal with. And I try to show that on the page that there's a, a moral component to combat that doesn't really get captured in movies or anything like that. Cause it's always the guy ends up doing the right thing. Uh, and Pike doesn't always do the right thing. Sometimes he makes mistakes and when he makes mistakes, some people get hurt because of it. And, and I like the other it. one though, I was talking about it, the bad guy, <laughs> he made a mistake in not looking at his, <laughs> his six and they get hit. And the guy he's wanting to interrogate gets killed. Yeah. They tried to save his life though. They yeah. sucking chest wound, did all the stuff on him. And that, that was great. It was gory, but it was really, it was just really, really good. I mean, I just had to know uh, when, when is too much. I mean, do you, is this something that you go through with your editor, with your team, um, or other people who are not your editors? Well, yeah. I mean, I write what I want to write. Right. And uh, if I really think it needs to stand in there, I'll fight for it. Um, yeah. These scenes didn't really hit it. I will say, in a day is my last book. I opened that thing up with a serial killer killing a female. And it was gory Stephen King whacking. You know, yeah. He's, I'm trying to say this guy is, here's what he's doing. He's got, he's tortured and he's killing this yeah. person. And my editor said, you're not opening the book by killing a female. That's just not going to happen. Mm. Not going to happen. And I said, yes, it has to happen. It has to happen. <laughs> and the very next chapter, a guy gets killed in a paragliding accident, assassination attempt. Yeah. He goes, you're killing another guy in the next chapter. Just open with that. We went back and forth and back and forth and I lost. And he said, so I had to do it by flashbacks. But that scene, I kept that chapter. I'm like, I'm just going to put this out in the world. Here's what it, how it should have started. Scale of one to 10, how hard was it for you to go back and, and change everything? To, uh, to, to where there are flashbacks instead of... Uh, it wasn't that hard uh, because uh, what had happened was uh, I'd, I'd, I'd written like five chapters and just said, here's where I'm going. He'd already ah, had the framework. Okay. I said, take a look at this. And he was like, no, you're yeah. not doing that. And so I had not gotten to the flashback scenes yet. And I was like, all right, I can do it. Um, continuing with the, uh, the writing process, uh, and you and I spoke about this last year, I am a fan of the alternating third person and first person, uh, chapters. And for those who are not familiar with, with this and how you got into writing this way, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, actually, actually it was quite painful. So I, uh, when I wrote my first book, I didn't have any writing instruction, so I just whacked a book out. I didn't know how to do chapters, so it was just one long chapter. Entire book. <laughs> um, it just went on forever. And uh, I, uh, I turned it into an editor or to an agent who rejected it and, uh, and said, would you be willing to work, for, work with a freelance editor? And I said, sure. Uh, and so she put me in, the agent put me in contact with uh, uh, a freelance editor from England who charges an enormous amount of money per page to do your book, which I couldn't afford. I was in the army and uh, her father was in the army. And so she found out I was in the army and she took a liking to me. He served in Sudan and, and Yemen and everywhere else. And um, she said, I'll tell you what, I'll do this for uh, 1% of your contract when it sells. Oh, and I was like, 1% of zero, zero. So, <laughs> yeah, Hashtag math. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so she would make me do these exercises, which Elaine would just, I'd come home. I didn't even have an email address at the time because I was still in a classified unit. And so I, she, the emails went to my wife's email address. And I'd walk in the door and I'd see Elaine like, I'd say, what? Carolyn emailed. Don't go crazy. And she would just rip apart my stuff, just tear it apart. And so she would make me do these uh, um, exercises, which I was like, what am I in high school? And she said, I want to know Pike's entire bio. And she sent the email. She said, I want it in the next 15 minutes. If you can't do it in 15 minutes and you haven't thought through the problem set. Ooh. And so I was like, okay. And who's seen the movie, The Jerk? So I opened it up just like that. I was born a poor black child. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all in first person. And it was just completely sarcastic and just absolutely brutal back. <laughs> and I sent it to her and she said, uh, that's some of the best writing you've done. And she said, 
<laughs> she said, anytime Pike is on the page, it needs to be in first person. Now, that was an entire rewrite. The entire book was in third person to begin with. Yeah. So then I had to go back from the very beginning, and anytime Pike was on the page, and she was right, because I was like, I can get a lot more out of Pike in first person mm -hmm. than I can in third person. And I get a lot more out when Jennifer's in third person with Pike wondering what she's doing, so it's not omniscient. Uh, but I had to rewrite the entire book that way, and I just kept at it. That's what I kept doing. Okay, so follow-up. How long did it take for you to write the original rough draft and then how long did it take for you to quote unquote fix it to where it's first person, third person, so on and so forth? Well, if you're talking about from flash to bang a publication, is that what you mean? Oh, no, no, no. Just from just the, the raw rough draft and then you turn it into your editor and she's like, nope, do first person, third person. And then so yeah. how long did it take for you to prepare it to where it's Oh, guess, it was shoppable? probably two years. Oh, wow. Yeah, a long time. Huh. So, I mean, I wrote the book by myself yeah. without anything, without chapters or anything. So <laughs> that's she hilarious. Like, she was like, uh, you've got a chapter one, but I don't see a chapter two and it's 185,000 words. <laughs> it's one chapter. You just got to read it. <laughs> so we, you know, she was, that took about two. Is, am I wrong on that lane? Two years? Yeah. So year and a half. Yeah. Year and a half. Wow. That is, that is outstanding. Um, so you're, you're at well over a dozen of these Pike Logan books. Um, what, what is the biggest challenge you face with writing such a, a successful longstanding series like this? Uh, I'd say there's two challenges. Number one is uh, character growth. You can't have Pike and Jennifer cannot remain static. He's, the, what he was in One Rough Man cannot be what he is in The Devil's Ransom. That's the hardest thing. And, it, and th throughout the teams, uh, Knuckles, Brett, Veep, Kylie, all of them have to grow. Uh, they have to change. If you go to college, you change. You have a kid, you change. You get married, you change. Life goes on. People are altered. And so that's the hardest thing is making sure. I mean, unless you're uh, Jack Reacher, who never changes. Every book is the exact same. <laughs> Otherwise, you've got to, the, the characters have to grow. So I'd say, overarchingly, that's probably the hardest thing to do. Tactically, I would say it's not doing the same thing. Every time you write a scene, when you first start writing, the entire universe is open. You can do whatever you want to. The minute you write that scene, you're kind of done with that. So if I say somebody's got blue eyes, well, he's got blue eyes forever. I could have made him any color. Now they're stuck in place. So when I do, there's only so many, unfortunately, there's only so many ways to skin the cat when you're doing a gunfight. Gunfights are kind of predictable. There's a way a gunfight's going to go. But if you do a gunfight, the, the next book, I'm like, okay, I did the gunfight like this. I got to change it up some. You eventually run out of ways to do it. There's only so many ways to do it. And so I'm constantly trying to find different ways to do certain things. Uh, like, uh, you know, well, speaking of gunfights, so if I get a gunfight and we're shooting at each other, nobody cares about that because I'm using a gun, we're shooting at each other, that's how it should work. Well, in modern day society, you're, I'm, the way you're going to find a bad guy is through his smartphone. That is just the way it is. You're going to find him. That's the reason Pegasus was invented. And if I want to find somebody, if you look at the Utah killings that went on right now, Cell phone stuff is all over that. Mm -hmm. Murtaugh murders from my home state of South Carolina, it's all cell phone stuff. You're going to get that guy through the cell phone. But that gets kind of boring. I mean, if somebody will email me and say, we did it with a cell phone again, that was kind of easy. <laughs> so I'm like, well, you know, actually, that's kind of how it works. You know, it's just like a gunfight. Oh, you used a gun in a gunfight? That's stupid. <laughs> uh, so, so I always try to find something else that's, uh, that I can use. And generally what I do is look at criminals. Mm. What does a criminal do? How are they doing this? And uh, in fact, I was writing New Fortune Son and I had, I didn't want to do the same old MZ grabber using all this stuff to find the cell phone to geolocate the guy. And I was in New York City and they had this big story that broke that uh, when you walk into a, uh, everybody's got their phone hooked to Wi-Fi. When you go into your house, it goes automatically to your own Wi-Fi. Nobody, very few people actually say, ask me every time before you connect to a network. If it's a network you've connected to before, your phone will automatically connect to it. So if you go into Starbucks and you get on their Wi-Fi, your phone will now think that every time I come to the Starbucks, I'm hooking up the Wi-Fi. Well, these criminals hovered a drone. There was a Starbucks in Manhattan and the first street intersection where everybody came out and had to wait for the light to change. They hovered a drone above the crowd of 30 people. Out of that 30 people, 10 of them had been in that Starbucks and they spoofed the router inside the Starbucks. So everybody's phone that was sitting there on the street waiting for the light to change, the phone said, oh, I'm back in Starbucks, hook up. And they hooked up to the drone and the drone drained all their personal information and, and stole their credit cards and everything else. And so I was like, okay, I can use that. That's how I'll find that phone. I'll 
run this drone around. I had to set up, you know, how the Wi-Fi worked and all that, but it was better than doing the same old stuff. Goodness gracious. I mean, it's like real life is it real life provides endless material. Yeah. Actually, so from that standpoint, you've, you've, you'll never run out of, I guess, fresh, fresh ideas. Well, I had it. So there's all kinds of ways you can figure out what a floor plan is. And uh, I had a, um, a Roomba in my house. You turn the Roomba on first time it runs around the house. It takes uh, eight hours to figure out where your furniture is. Second time it's six hours. Third time it's four hours till it's running around the house for an hour and a half because mm -hmm. it knows where the furniture is. Well, it sends that furniture data to the cloud, oh. which is basically the floor plan of a house. Oh, gosh. So they were going to crack this house, and I had my own Roomba, which I bashed with a hammer. And it's like, you're not telling anything. <laughs> <you're not doing." laughs> so, but I was like, that's how I'm going to get this floor plan. So the cyber guys, network engineers at the task force, my own task force, cracked the Wi-Fi password, hit the Roomba, figured out the floor plan, and then Pike hits a house using a floor plan from a Roomba. But that's a real thing. They, it's in there. I'm never buying a Roomba. <laughs> Or an Alexa, I can go off on that one too. Oh yeah, we don't have one of those at home. Ugh, I begrudgingly get the software updates because I'm worried that something is going to happen. I don't know yeah. why. I'm just paranoid like that. I know about the Utah database. I'm just scared. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you talk, is getting sucked up somewhere. Yeah, it, yeah, it's all getting. Yeah, it all goes somebody uh, somewhere. But um, let's wrap up before we do audience Q and A uh, with a bit of a lightning round. Who dies first in a zombie apocalypse? Pike, Knuckles. Or Jennifer? None of them. <laughs> okay. Are you kidding me? You shoot a zombie in the head, right? That's how you get rid of a zombie. They can all shoot pretty well. That, okay, true story. All right. I, I didn't flesh that one out well enough. Okay. All Those right. are zombies. Touche. If Pike could serve under any 19th century president, not Abe, who would it be? Are you kidding me? It can't be Abe. 19th century? 19th century. Ulysses S. Grant. Good deal. Is he 19th century? Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to guess Franklin Pierce or Millard Fillmore, but I was wrong. If Pike Logan were to give a TEDx talk, what would be the subject? These are the kind of questions I get asked the other day. You know, it's like, <laughs> I always ask these people this question before they leave my interview. What would you tell yourself as a teenager? I'm like, really? You could have told me you were going to ask me this question beforehand. So I, the first thing I came up with was, don't steal the car. <laughs> <laughs> Tell your teenage self not to take that car. Uh, I wanted to answer, you know, oh, I'm an oak tree. Oh, I thought you were asking me what kind of tree I'd be. Uh, talking about, if you did a TED Talk, you'd talk about uh, nascent threats to the United States that uh, we don't really see, that are all over the place, because there's a lot of them, and they don't make the news. I believe it, unfortunately. Who is most likely to turn on Pike, Knuckles, or Jennifer? To turn on Pike? What kind of questions are these? They're not... <laughs> You mean they're moles from Russia or something? Yeah, or? who knows? <laughs> Neither one of them. Okay, all right. Well, if you've read The Devil's Ransom, I guess it would be Knuckles. Because <laughs> he, in fact, turns on Pike for a little bit. Oh, uh, yeah. 200 years into the future, this one, this one will be easier. 200 years into the future, somebody stumbles across your body of work, but they can only read one book. Which oh, one is it? I hate it? this question. That's like saying, you've got five kids, I'm going to kill four. Which one do you want to save? <laughs> I wasn't going to ask you what your favorite book is of the series, though. <laughs> That's basically what you're asking. <laughs> I would say that uh, um, if you had to only read one, it would encapsulate both the trauma Pike went through in One Rough Man all the way up to what he is now, all the way into uh, the character development I was talking about. It would probably be uh, No Fortune Son. Audience Q&A, anybody have a question that would be willing to come up to the mic? I set up a mic right here in front of the table. Oh, well, they're never going to do that. So that I could put you, so that I could put you, not just, not just put you on the spot, but put you on the podcast. If anybody has ever been on the radio or on a podcast that would like to do it, or you can just stand up and ask your question. It doesn't matter. But you've got the option of being on Freddie's Huge Ask podcast. Any <laughs> audience questions? Anybody? There's Go ahead. Question. You're going to come up? Oh, yes. My name is George, and I was the one you talked to earlier about his writing practices. Um, how much, uh, do you have a writing quote of how much you try to produce every day? No, actually, that's almost a setup question. The, uh, I, I try to do that, because you Google, how do I be a writer? Mm -hmm. And you learn I'm supposed to do 1,000 words a day, 1,500 words a day. And uh, I found that if I did that for, uh, I would, before I was ready to actually put it on the page, mm -hmm. I would end up deleting it all. So now I'll go five days without writing anything and then go through bursts of frantically writing because it's in my head. People always, I think that people, when they say, how often do you write? Where's your writing desk? 
Uh, what music do you listen to when you're writing? That kind of thing. Yeah. I'm always writing. What they really mean is when do you type? Because I only type when I'm done writing in my head. I'm writing when I'm working out. I'm writing when I'm walking with the dog. I'm writing when I'm in the shower. I'm writing when I'm driving the car. And then when it coalesces in my head, then I will sit down and type and put it on the page. But for me, typing is not writing. And I'll do that anywhere. I don't have a writing desk. I'll do it in bars, on airplanes, in, in uh, gymnastics meets, at volleyball tournaments. Uh, I'll get on my bike and ride to the uh, beach or, or the waterfront park where they and write or actually type. But I don't have a set schedule. And my record is 8,000 words a day for four days. That's so, pretty good. Kind of impressive. I'm on, that is yes. very impressive. <laughs> a deadline will do that. Deadlines do that. I hear you. I'm a journalist. I know. <laughs> How much coffee do you drink coffee? I was actually on a security contract. I was in the barracks. I worked all day and then typed all night. Oh, geez. Wow. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? We got this room full of people and no questions. You don't ah, have there to come we go. up. He's scaring people, making them come up here. Scaring. <laughs> go ahead. I'm Kent. Uh, good to meet you. Good to meet you, um, Kent. I have a question about- You can talk right in the mic. Uh, I have a question about Shoshana and uh -huh. her sixth sense or whatever sure. you want to call it about how she feels what's happening right. a world away. Where did that come from in your- experience or writing or that the, uh, idea? I, when I originally came out to Shoshana, and first of all, I, uh, some of the people who have been to uh, several of the book signings here, so I probably know this story, but uh, she came out in Days of Rage, uh, which was, it starts off the Munich Massacre in 1972. The wrestling coach of that uh, massacre uh, at the Olympics in 1972 in the fictional world is her grandfather. And so she has, a obviously, a hatred of terrorism. But she, I was going to whack her. She was a one-book thing. So I'm going to just, she served a purpose in Days of Rage, and I was going to kill her at the end of it. And I wanted to make something that was a complete, a mirror image of Pike, but in a twisted way. So uh, I, I went through the whole thing, and Pike is kind of meat and potatoes. And so I, I said, okay, she's going to have some kind of skill set that she doesn't even understand. She can see something that she doesn't even know what it is. She kind of sees colors. She doesn't even know why she's seeing it. She just knows that when she does, something bad's going on. And uh, at the end of that book, I liked her too much. I was just like, okay, I'm not going to kill her. I'll, <laughs> I'll let her finish the book off. She actually ends the book, and she rides off in the sunset. And then two books later, she's not in every book. Two books later, I was in Jordan doing the insider thread about ISIS, and uh, I was creating a character out of whole cloth, which is a lot of damn work. Her and Aaron took a lot of buildup to get them where they are. And uh, then I was like, why are you building a whole new character? You put those people on a shelf. Why don't I put them in here? You've already done all the work for that. So I did. And I got all these emails. Ah, oh, they're back. Great. It's like, well, thank God I didn't kill them. Because <laughs> I was going to whack them off. But that was, it was more of an antithesis of Pike. Somebody, I actually got an email saying, oh, you picked her to be female because you're, uh, you know, trying to cultivate the female audience. And I'm kind of like, you really give me a lot of credit that I can <laughs> sit here and juggle what the reading public wants to do. No, I was just going to write what I wanted to write. And Pike was male, so she became female. Uh, and her and Jennifer bonded right off the bat, and they have a unique relationship. Um, but it was more of a, a, I just wanted to create something the opposite of Pike, because that's why they're always fighting. Even though they're the same, they think they're opposites. You say, oh, well, I got emails from people who loved the character, and it's like, okay, I, good, I didn't kill her. Is there somebody that you killed off that, oh, somebody, yeah. <laughs> that somebody reached out and was like, how dare you? Oh, I still get it. So there's a guy named Decoy who I built up as a huge character. Actually, it's the same book, Days of Rage. So he was in from All Necessary Force On. And uh, he was a great character. And it fit in Days of Rage. I give 100% to the book I'm writing. 100%. I don't worry about the fallout for the next book. Some people say, you know, I'm going to do this in this book, and then five books later, I'll do that. Mm. I, mine's 100% on this book. And at that point in time, this was perfect for Jennifer's growth, for what was going to happen in the book, he had to go, and um, she failed to save him. He gets shot. He's dead. And I really loved that character, and then I started getting hate mail. <laughs> what are you talking about? I can't believe you did that. I actually have a person who follows me on Twitter whose handle is Lady D, oh, God. Lady Decoy. And she <laughs> has hated me ever since. How dare so you? So I did regret it because then when the next book comes along, I'm like, man, I could really use Decoy in this because he was a great character, uh, but I'd killed him. Couldn't use him again. That was the end of that. Mm, mm -mm, the audacity. Uh, any other questions? We got one. All right. Cool. My brother got me into your books. I've read all of them in the last year. All right. 
I just, I love it. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, kind of about killing decoy. I she had hates a, me. Uh -oh. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we didn't have a security check before the signing. I apologize. <laughs> I'll take the bullet. <laughs> just um, kidding. A few paragraphs I had to reread, like when uh, Warren died or um, Decoy died or uh, when Jennifer got shot. Things that I had to read like, no, wait, did that just happen? Yeah. When you start writing the book, do you know that that's going to happen ahead of time? Or is that something that happens in development? Like, did you know Decoy was going to die no, when you sat down? I did not. And that's kind of the strategic. I knew the strategic arc. But when I got to that fight with the uh, uh, Russians that were going on inside Istanbul, and Decoy's a great guy. He's already in the Widow's Strike. It was the Widow's Strike. Did we go to Thailand for the Widow's Strike, Elaine? Yes. In the Widow's Strike, Decoy does a, a – he's heroic with Jennifer doing a lot of stuff. And he and so they had a bond. And when that came around, I was like, okay, this is what's going to happen here. I did not set out to do that. Uh, it just was at that moment in time I said, okay, I'm going to write it right now like that. Um, and I, I kind of do that. Part of me is, um, I was talking about combat earlier. Combat's unforgiving. I mean, it just is. You can be the best operator on the planet and you can also be dead, uh, for the stupidest reasons. Maybe you should have gone left. You went right and ran right into a bullet. When you see somebody that's been killed in combat and you're like, that guy's invincible. How did he get killed? And why am I still alive? That guy's the best fighter ever. Uh, and so I try to show that, you know, there's sometimes things don't go right. And it, uh, it kind of enhances, I think, personally, enhances the reading of, okay, this is what goes on here. It's not a, you know, everybody rides off from the sunset cheering. Sometimes things don't go right. But I did not plan. I did plan Warren. I knew Warren was going. <laughs> I did not plan Kurt Hale. And uh, I don't know if I should say this. Uh-oh. <laughs> So he had, uh, um, I did not plan Kurt Hale. And when I, originally what was going to happen was um, he was, the, the whole scene was going to happen, which I'm not giving you away if you haven't read it, but he was going to go to the hospital and then he'd recuperate and come out. And as I wrote it and wrote it and wrote it, uh, I was kind of like, no, he's got to, because Pike has got to go crazy. I mean, he's going to lose everything he's got to go kill these guys. No matter what the oversight council says, he's going to burn it all the ground. You're not going to stop me. Uh, and the only way to do that was he had to go. So I had him in the hospital. And I was like, well, Pike would say, instead of saying, I'm going to go burn this down, he'd say, give me an update on Kurt. How's he doing? Oh, he's come out of ICU. Looks like he's going to make it. Okay, I'll come home then. Instead, when he, you know, he's gone immediately, Kurt's like, I'm going to kill every one of you. So. After, a, after the death of a character that you like, and obviously your, your fans like, but this is before they know that they're going to die. But so when, when you're in the process and somebody dies, do you sort of have a, a mini Brad Taylor vigil in your head for this character? Because maybe this is someone that you weren't planning on killing or, or actually there's vigils planning? in the books. So I knew that, you know, the task force is fake. We don't have a, anything yeah, yeah, like yeah. the task force. It's uh, I've created out a whole cloth. Cause I didn't want anybody to think that I was writing about classified organization I'd served in and was just changing the names for fiction, but I knew they'd have a ceremony. Uh, and the Forgotten Soldier was the first time it was seen. It's seen in the second time in this book. When somebody gets uh, harmed in combat, and you're not going to have uniforms. There's not going to be a bunch of flag waving. It's going to be these guys going to a certain place yeah. and doing a toast when nobody knows who they are, and that's what they do. Everything else, what you know, the government does is what the government's going to do. But I knew they'd have a ceremony. And Guy was a guy. Now, Guy I did plan, and he, I knew he was going. If you've read Forgotten Soldier, he was going from the get-go, um, which was the whole point of the book. Um, I developed, you know, this is the ceremony. I've been to a bunch of those ceremonies, so I developed my own ceremony. Uh, and that's, I guess, the vigil for him. Does, does it ever bother you, though? So if you're writing a draft and two, two weeks later after you kill somebody, you're like, golly, I really wish I didn't, but I'm glad I'm going this route. No. I, when I'm, like I say, I give 100% in that book. I mean, when mm -hmm. I was writing Days of Rage and Decoy died, that was it. There yeah. was no two ways about it. It had to go that way. Kurt Hale, yeah. she was mentioning... I, I couldn't do it any other way. Mm -hmm. I would not get the emotional response from Pike by just saying, you know, he's out of surgery and doing well. Yeah. Uh, so no, I never second guess it. No, I second guess it in the next book when I'm writing him going, why did I do that? That's was not a smart thing to do. I mean, Amina is a good example of that. Amina is their uh, Syrian refugee they've adopted. When I wrote uh, daughter of war, that book was called shadow strike for the entire time. 
she was supposed to be up till chapter four and then she was exiting stage left. I didn't know if I was going to kill her, if she was going to run away or whatever. Pike was going to get on thread and that was the end of Amina. By the time I got to chapter four, I liked her too much. It's like, she's staying in. And then she took over the entire book. And it's a really good book. It's one of my favorite books. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, now she's in the Pike universe. What do I do with her? Mm -hmm. How am I going to deal with this in the next book? But I never worry about the next book when I'm writing this book. I don't care. I'll figure that out later. I'm not going to spend any time worrying about it. Any other questions? What kind of sixth grader were you in school? <laughs> sixth grader. <laughs> and uh, memory of a, of a good friend of my mother's who was actually my history teacher in ninth grade. Dorothy Graham uh, just passed away this year. She's been to every book signing here. Uh, and she just passed away. She was my, uh, she was so proud of me because she said, I thought she'd be in jail, but you've done, <laughs> you've done so well for yourself. Uh, and she was my ninth grade history teacher, showed up one day. Lovely. <laughs> All right, so that's going to do it. Everybody, The Devil's Ransom is the new book. You guys got it. You uh, are ready for some autographs. Thank you so much for being a part of the podcast. And a special thanks to Murder by the Book, John and McKenna and the crew. Brad, congratulations on another one. Thank you. My man. All right, give it up for Brad Taylor. Yes. Hey, it's me. I'm back with a quick little nudge. If you enjoyed this podcast as much as I did putting it together for you, then please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe to the newsletter at cruisethroughhtx.com and share with your family and friends. Thank you.